A uniform disc of radius 25 cm and mass 100 kg rests in a vertical plane perpendicular to a curb stone 10 cm high. A force F is applied to the disc at an angle theta to the horizontal, where 10 of theta is 4 thirds. Now we have a contact force on the disc due to the curb stone. The contact force is perpendicular to the surface of contact. So we have to draw a line here that's perpendicular to um, the edge of this disc. And any line that's perpendicular to the edge of a disc passes through the center of the disc. So the curb stone exerts a force on the disc in a direction that passes through the center of the disc. Let's call that force R. Now force F is assumed to be acting through the center of this disc. We also have the weight of the disc vertically down. We can place this weight vector at the center of gravity of the disc. The weight is 100 g. Um, the disc is in contact with the horizontal ground, of course, so we have a contact force on the disc due to the ground. Let's call that force N. It's at right angles to the surface of contact. Again, if we have um, a line drawn at right angles to um, the curve on the circle, that line passes through the center of the circle. Well, you can also see that from the fact that the ground is tangential to the circle. Okay, and if we draw a line from the center to the point of contact of the tangent, that line is perpendicular to the tangent. And the normal force is perpendicular to the circle at this point. So let's suppose that this disc is in equilibrium, so it hasn't moved over the curb stone yet. That means the resultant force on it is zero. In particular, the sum of the horizontal components will be zero. You can see that this diagram is not to scale. Um, I'll just try and make it slightly more realistic. So we want the horizontal component of R. So these two components have to balance. They have to be equal in magnitude. Um, let's call this angle in here alpha. So F cos theta must equal R cos alpha. Now we have a pair of corresponding angles here. This is alpha, then this angle in here is alpha. The radius of the circle is 25, so the distance from here to here is 10, which means that the distance from here to here is 15. The distance from here to here is the radius of the circle, which is 25. So, um, you know, to get cos alpha, we need to side adjacent alpha. So we just use Pythagoras. So this distance is the square root of the hypotenuse squared, 25 squared minus the other short side squared. So cos alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse, 20 over 25. Now uh, we want cos of theta. We are given theta actually, tan of theta is 4 thirds. So opposite over adjacent. So the hypotenuse is 5 by Pythagoras. So uh, cos is 3 fifths. So we have f times 3 fifths here. So we want to get r in terms of what we are given. We are given f in this problem, OK? So we want to get r in terms of f. So we get r equals 3 quarters f. Now let's consider the vertical components. I'm showing the vertical components in blue, so the upwards ones are shown. We have r sine alpha plus n plus f sine theta. So these three upward components, must the sum of them must equal the weight, which is 100g. Now, if the disc is just on the verge of moving, it means that n will drop to zero. So basically, all we have to do is find out what happens when n is equal to zero. We don't have to worry about what goes on after that. Um, we just want the contact force on the disc due to, to the ground to vanish. Okay, so we want to sub zero into this equation. Okay, so n is gone. What is r? r is 3 quarters f. Get everything in terms of f. Um, what is sine of alpha? Well, we get, the, get it from this picture. Sine of alpha is opposite over hypotenuse, 15 over 25. Then we have f times sine of theta. So we just go back up here. Theta was in here. Tan of theta was 4 thirds, so sine of theta is 4 fifths. So if you solve this equation, you get f equals 784 newtons. So that's the least amount of force required for the contact force on the disc due to the ground to become zero. Okay, we want this to go to zero essentially. 
A uniform rod of length 2P and weight W rests with its lower end A in contact with a smooth hemispherical bowl of radius P. The axis of the bowl is vertical. The upper end of the rod projects beyond the rim of the bowl. The point B on the rod is in contact with the rim of the bowl. The distance between A and B is 2P times cos of theta. Find in terms of W the reaction at B. Okay, we have um, three forces acting on this rod. We have the weight of the rod, which is at the midpoint of the rod since it's um, a uniform rod, okay? We treat the rod as if it's a particle of weight W at this point. Um, we have two contact forces on the rod, okay? Um, the bowl exerts a force on the rod in a direction perpendicular to the surface of contact. And that's, that's a line that passes through the center of the bowl. If we if we were to draw a tangent here at the point of contact, then the line of action of S would be perpendicular to the tangent, which means that it passes through the center of the circle. We have another contact force on the rod at B. Here, part of the surface of contact is a part of the rod, so we want our force to be perpendicular to, to the surface of contact, which means it will be perpendicular to the rod. Okay, just to go back over this again. If um, one of the surfaces of contact is a part of a circle, then if we take any line that's perpendicular to a piece of the circumference of a circle, it always passes through the center of the circle. Okay, so our force has to be perpendicular to those two surfaces of contact. So we can't show this force along the rod. We have to actually show it pointing towards the center of the circle. That's the actual direction. Up here, one of the surfaces of contact is a part of the rod. So if we draw a force perpendicular to it, it's going to be perpendicular to the rod. Okay, to answer part one, we take moments about the point A. So that means we can ignore um, this force S, because its moment about the point A is zero. Okay, so um, R has an anti-clockwise moment about the point A. W has a clockwise moment, so the anti-clockwise moment equals the clockwise moment. So we multiply r by the perpendicular distance of the line of action of r to a, which we were given in the question, is 2p cos theta. And as for w, well, the center of gravity is at the midpoint of the rod. The rod has length 2p in total. So this distance, well, we have to be careful here. Let's get this distance first. It's half of 2p, which is p. And we want the perpendicular distance of a to the line of action of w which is this distance here. So we have to multiply p by the cos of theta to get a side adjacent to theta. So we get w multiplied by p cos of theta. We end up seeing that r has half the magnitude of the weight of the rod. Now the next question looks a bit strange, um, but you can actually derive this result here if it's possible for alpha to equal theta. If you set alpha equal to theta in um, this problem here and just consider the resultant force on the rod, you can derive this result. Now, I don't know what the justification for doing this is. Um, apparently, it's possible for alpha to equal theta. I thought alpha could be constrained. You can't just let it equal anything you like. Uh, for you know for equilibrium, but apparently it can equal theta and Anyway, if we go and get the resultant force on the rod and make this substitution we can derive this result here Okay, so um, The resultant force on this is zero so that means that the sum of the horizontal components is zero So let's get the horizontal components of the forces. Well W has no horizontal component the horizontal component of R points to the left. So how do we find it? Well, we note that this angle in here is the same as this angle in here. Now, why is that? Well, the angle, this pair of lines here, um, makes the same angles with, makes the same angle theta with this pair here. Okay, um, you can see that 
you know, we have a vertical line here, makes an angle of 90, well, when I say angle, it makes an angle of 90 degrees. This line makes an angle of 90 degrees with this line, and the line that R is on makes an angle of 90 degrees with the rod. So we have a pair of lines that make the same angle, that is 90 degrees, with another pair of lines. So that means that the angle in between both pairs of lines is the same. Now we've seen this kind of argument before. So we know that this is theta, and we want to bring theta into the problem. Okay, that's what we're given in the question. So we multiply r by sine of theta to get this component. And as for s, well, we're setting um, alpha equal to theta. So um, to get its horizontal component, we need to multiply s by the cos of 2 theta. Okay, so the horizontal component of s points to the right. The horizontal component of r points to the left. So we have this equation here. Now we can go back to the previous part and replace r with half w. So we can get s in terms of w and theta. Now let's look at the vertical components. Here's the vertical component of r. It's pointing up the way. We just multiply r by the cos of theta to get that. Here's the vertical component of s. We multiply s by the sine of uh, 2 theta. Okay, if we sum these two upwards vertical forces, we must get w. So we get this result here. Next, we substitute in for r and in for s. So we have s in terms of w and theta. We plug it in here. And we have r in terms of w. Well, r is just half w or w over 2. The w's cancel out. Multiply all of this thing here by 2 times cos 2 theta. And we'll cancel the 2 here. We get a cos 2 theta times cos theta here. We cancel this here. And we'll have sine theta times... Um, well, sorry, we'll cancel the 2 cos 2 theta. And we're left with sine theta times sine 2 theta. And we have our 2 cos 2 theta on the right hand side. Okay, so just multiply across by this. Now, if you look long enough at this here, you will see that it has the form um, cos a cos b plus sine a sine b. Cos a cos b plus sine a sine b. And that's identical to cos of a minus b. Where a is 2 theta and b is theta. But notice that we have cos 2 theta on the right hand side, so now we end up deriving our result.